John? John? We need Are you giving us a bed? Do we have to leave now? When was the last time the government did not pose uh, regulations on a man's body, imposed? And until very recently, in the historical scheme of things, whether by democratic governments or absolute monarchies, men's bodies have been co-opted in the form of military service without their consent since time immemorial, until World War II, when military service became voluntary in most of the free world, uh, almost coincident with the arrival of the pill, which gave women control over their reproductive functions. The difference is, of course, that notwithstanding Margaret Atwood's lurid projections in The Handmaid's Tale, if the nation were at risk of invasion, the military draft would be reinstated. But women in Canada or any other democratic country are never going to be forced by the government to bear children they don't want. And even in countries where women are drafted, they are not obliged to serve in combat. A woman uh, who does not have an abortion after 18 weeks of pregnancy may endure several months of inconvenience, but a man whose body has been put at the service of the state in combat not only suffers extreme inconvenience over every minute of every day uh, of his service, normally a much longer period than pregnancy, he runs a very high risk of ending up uh, maimed or dead. But I was not surprised to see the woman's question posed because the wrongs that uh, men do are front and center in our cultural consciousness, but the sacrifices men make and are expected to make as a matter of course are taken for granted. I ended that column with the observation that both sexes have bodies uh, throughout human history. The primary purpose of those bodies have been divided between reproduction of the species and prote protection of those who reproduce the species. Um, now, the woman who posed that question represents a cultural condition mirroring uh, a neurological syndrome called hemispatial neglect. Um, it's also known as hemi oh, you know about this. Also known as hemiagnosia, hemispatial neglect is a rare phenomenon in the neurological world characterized by the inability of those afflicted to process and perceive stimuli on one side of their environment. The most striking feature of the condition is that the victim not only fails to see what is usually in the left field of vision, but is also unaware of the fact that the other side of the environment even exists. So it's not like blindness, because a blind person knows they cannot see. The person suffering from hemispatial neglect does not realize that he or she cannot see half of what is under their nose. If you put a plate of food in front of a person with hemispatial neglect, he will only eat the food on the right side of the plate and he will believe he has finished it. In the cultural version of this affliction, the condition is not rare at all. Indeed, it's remarkably common, affecting almost all academics in our university humanities and social science departments, most politicians, and most media commentators. Cultural hemiagnosia presents as a failure to see or even to be aware of the fact that half the population, the male half, are victims of violence or injustice or false allegations or educational neglect or anything that requires society's active sympathy or special resources to redress. Um, I have addressed this affliction on several occasions and today I, I was going back over past columns that I wrote even years ago uh, to find some good examples of this and I'm, I'm going to bring up a few because I believe that these issues deserve uh, a second reading kind of because they've been forgotten and I remember at the time how agitated I was uh, and uh, they've called it fallen off the map, so I want to bring them back for, for a second look. In December 2010, uh, Cornwall Inquiry Commissioner Justice Norman Glode issued a 2400-page report deploring the systematic, decades-long failure of the Ontario Provincial Police, the Provincial Government, the Catholic Diocese, the Ontario Correctional Services, and other institutions to deal appropriately, when they dealt at all, with sexual abuse of boys and young men by an alleged pedophile ring involving 15 priests, lawyers, doctors, and probation officers in the Cornwall area. Do you remember that Cornwall yeah. inquiry coming back? The Cornwall
Paul's story began in 1994 with an altar boy's charge that he had been abused by a priest. It broadened into the OPP-led Project Truth, which in turn raised so many questions that it morphed into the $50 million Cornwall inquiry involving four years of hearings, 167 witnesses, and 3,640 written exhibits. In his thoughtful assessment of the scandal's chronology, Justice Glode called on the province to fulfill 235 recommendations. But a funny thing happened between the published recommendation and the media's reportage of same. All the mainstream media covered the report's release. But even though all the victims relating to the 114 charges laid in Project Truth were boys and men, and even though in his 75-minute verbal statement, Justice Clo Glode uh, referenced males or men as those abused 17 times, almost all references in all media were to victims, the vulnerable, young people, children, and youths. The CBC referenced men as offenders, but the abused only as victims. Only the National Post referenced specifically to male pain twice, and the Globe once. Uh, this is hard to understand given the report's statements below. These, rep this, these statements come out of the report. Institutions faced with allegations, quote, did not understand the serious impact of abuse or about responses typical of boys and young men. Quote, lack of training, particularly in the area of abuse of boys and young men, men hampered even well-intentioned individuals. Quote, police forces were not well equipped to provide support to victims of historical sexual abuse, particularly men. And quote, I have concluded that as a society, we must recognize the impact of historical abuse and respond more, more appropriately. In particular, the needs of male victims must be addressed. Particularly negligent in the light of the dire need for services for boys and men suffering sexual or partner abuse was the media's omission of this important nudge. Quote, men need integrated and coherent plans for services and a way of tracking and measuring implementation and effectiveness of services, right now there is no integrated plan. For Ontario women in distress, at the time there were 39 permanently funded shelters and numerous other programs. For Ontario's male victims of intimate partner violence, straight or gay, there was no dedicated shelter at all, only the precariously funded The Men's Project in Ottawa, offering healing and support services, there was also a, Con a Cornwall branch, apparently for show, since the government closed it down as soon as the inquiry finished. So, how many people today are even aware that there was such a thing as a Cornwall inquiry or remember the disgrace of those pedophile rings? I have never seen them mentioned since then. Never. I am sure the boys who were victims at, in, these, in this scandal bear the same psychological scars as those children who were abused in the residential schools. But compassion for male, males in our society wears an identity politics face. If you are a male member of an official victim group, you will find sympathy from our cultural elites and the media, and especially from our lachrymose prime minister. <laughs> if you are not, you will find yourself in the oubliette of gender history. Another gender study I covered showed how deeply boys' invisibility had penetrated the health system, allegedly Canada's most sacred icon for universe universality of service. In 2000, Marion Boyd, a former attorney general in Bob Ray's Ontario NDP government, convened a publicly funded task force on the health effects of women abuse for the Middlesex London Health Unit. Its advisory panel included representatives from London's hospitals, community agencies, the judicial system, the police force, psychologists, and the then director of London's Children Aid Society. Everyone on Boyd's panel was intimately familiar with the 1980s era abuse scandals 
and some would later testify at the Cornwall inquiry, almost entirely, as mentioned, about boys, boy victims. Yet, astonishingly, all signed off on Boyd's final report, which recommended a health unit protocol for screening only women 12 years and older for present or past abuse. Rux was proudly bruited to the 137,000 registered nurses of Ontario as a best practice. That's 137,000 women, I'm sure, or 136,729. In separate telephone interviews, I asked two of these registered nurses uh, spokeswomen to provide an ethical rationale for Rux. Their explanations were, there is no evidence to support the screening of men at this time. This is after the Cornwall report that I just referenced. Uh, or, we know it is helpful for women, but we don't know if asking men about their past is helpful. <laughs> and another said, screening boys may do more harm than good. <laughs> Particularly disingenuous was the assertion that male abuse issues are understudied. That was one uh, explanation I got. Well, it's under, so we really don't know a lot because it's understudied. Well, that was nonsense because impeccable research abounds, uh, which the RNAO, I suspect for ideological reasons, under consults. So they're not understudied, they're under consulted. As a, as a merely curious layperson, um, via a few queries and googlings, I had no trouble whatsoever finding credible peer-reviewed research on exactly this topic. Taking one example of many, in a 2005 article in the Journal of Child and Adolescent Psychiatric Nursing, one finds a study concluding, quote, sexual abuse is a serious problem, but the boys and men who have been abused rarely report this experience unless asked during a ther therapeutic encounter. So in other words, if they were admitted to the hospital for another reason and they were asked, they would reveal that. And, quote, those professionals who do not screen both boys and girls for abuse are not meeting professional obligations by withholding services that they know or should know would be beneficial to their patient client. So she could have Googled that and found that article too. Well. I promise you both invisible, that was invisible, uh, and invidious, so we'll go onward to invidious. Invidious comes in two models, light and heavy. Light is what you see when you turn on the TV, and you see a comedy series where there's both a mom and a dad. The mom is smart and witty and looks great. The dad is a slob, incompetent, or a subject for mockery by both his wife and children. Likewise in ads. You've seen this a million times, I don't have to go into. Although the ads are changing, by the way. There are some good ads that really show men in very good light. And that's changed over the last, since I wrote, I was doing this research, that, that changed a lot. And then there is invidious heavy. And that can be all summed up in this one article, which many of you may have seen. Why can't we all, why can't we hate men? Uh, this, is, this article is by Susanna Danuta Walters, a Northeastern University professor of sociology and director of its Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies program, which appeared in the Washington Post on June 8th, this June 8th, entitled, Why Can't We Hate Men? And in it, she catalogs all the usual crimes of toxic masculinity, sexual violence, terrorism, mansplaining, higher wages, better jobs, etc. The world as seen through her hostile lens is binary, all women are vulnerable, all men are a risk to them. But she's also uh, very funny, she doesn't mean to be. Uh, she, says, <laughs> she says, the world has little place for feminist anger, oh. <laughs> right, funny. Um, it ends with a paragraph, it ends with a paragraph that kind of says it all. So men. If you, you are really with us, hashtag with us, and would like us to not hate you for all the millennia of woe you have produced and benefited from, start with this. Lean out so we can actually just stand up without being beaten down. 
pledge to vote for feminist women only. Hmm. Don't run for office. Oh. Don't be in charge of anything. Step away from the power. We got this. <laughs> and please know that your crocodile tears won't be wiped away by us anymore. We have every right to hate you. You have done us wrong. Hashtag because patriarchy. It is long past time to play hard for team feminism and win. That's quite a pep talk. <laughs> so how how is this article a horror show? She did get a backlash. A, it's a horror show, this article, but so let me count the ways why. Okay. It ascribes oppressor status to an entire class of people. Uh, and oppressed status to all members of another class, this is evidence of a totalitarian mindset. Two, it posits a state of original sin, which is inherent in maleness, with redemption possible only through self-sacrifice. I'm finished, I've got two seconds. On women's behalf, and hey, you told me 20 minutes, I'm, and a handing over of power. It misconstrues and stains the precious word right. It is hate speech. But mostly, it is a, a horror show because a respectable mainstream newspaper thought it was fit content for their pages, yeah, yeah. which mm -hmm. tells us a great deal about what is culturally acceptable discourse in our society. All invidious gender discourse is a variation on this piece. This is merely the most candid. The good news is that the article attracted a great deal of negative attention and even demands that Danuta be fired or at least censured by her university. The bad news is she wasn't. But perhaps this is asking too much because, after all, it's still only 2018. Thank you. <laughs>